Hello all, sorry. <laughs> Can y'all hear me? You're all you're all silenced. And we have one minute to get everybody on here. Now can you hear me? Yeah, you know, yeah, now, but you know what I have to do too? I probably have to turn my little speaker up. Miss Deborah. <laughs> Dennis, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Oh, we need one more person to have a quorum. So hopefully we have someone. Greg is not going to be here. Stoney is not going to be here, probably. Madsen is going to be doing a presentation, so. James, I don't know that you can hear me, but I'm glad you're here um, to help us discern and, and kind of think about Madsen's presentation as well, <clears throat> some more, so. Who cool beans? It's four oh one. Hi, James. Nice to see you in this lovely outdoors. Yes, it is pretty nice out. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I'm looking out my window at it. So am I. I'm at our South Avenue office. I'm sorry, Kathy. I only caught like a small section of what you just said. Um, I was having audio troubles. Oh, I just said you look, we're all jealous of you sitting outside. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then Deborah said she wished she had thought of that. I'm like three feet from outside. Ben, we cannot see you. Um, did you log on to our link? And could you unmute yourself? Oh, there you are. Now we now you need to unmute. Look at that. There you are. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. I was just promoted to a panelist. So yes. I think I am here now. Cool. Okay, we have not started yet. We are, we do not have a quorum. We need one more person to have a quorum. So um, we have a quorum. Merita just, woohoo, just logged in. So that makes it lovely. Hi. Marita, thank you. Um, I do believe Danny will be here. We know that Greg cannot be here. And we also know um, that Stoney may or may not be able to make it. Um, Brianna, am I missing anyone else? Sorry, I didn't want my video to show. I accidentally did oh. that. Um, Tiana might and, not oh, be And Tiana may, may or not be able to make it. I'm sorry. Um, cool. So that being said, it is 4.03. And um, I would like to call the meeting to order. So Brianne, if you don't mind putting all of our um, information up on the screen, as far as who to talk to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, welcome to those members of the public. Brianne, can you help me also if people are in the chat room because um, I am not seeing one in at, oh, actually I am seeing, um, oh old messages. Anyway, so if um, you would like to attend by phone, our cell phone users, our numbers are 253-215-8782-213-338-8477-267-831-0333. And if you are on a landline, you may call 888 
475-4499 or 877-853-5257. Uh, please know that our webinar ID is 869-248-99859. The password is 574-069. And again, um, Brianna will help me, but if you would like to um, press star nine to raise your hand to be recognized for public comment and star six to mute yourself. So that being said, um, I would open the meeting for public comment if we have members of the public attending. Um, Brianna, I'm not missing anyone. I think we do not have anyone. So that being said, I'm gonna move on to the minutes. Did everyone have a chance to look at the September minutes? Yes. Yep. Cool, cool. Um, do we have any additions or corrections to the minutes? Well, I did see something interesting here uh, about Elizabeth Jonkel that there were four boxes of public art committee history. Mm -hmm. that, that sounded kind of interesting. Is that? Elizabeth is Joan's daughter and she right. had talked to Carl Brown. Um, some of you may know Joan Junko passed. She was a longtime chair of the public art committee and did amazing work for us. And she, passed away, but Elizabeth, her daughter, who is the assistant director of this um, public library, found some of her um, past information from the public art committee. So she's trying to get it all together in one place and then we'll give it to us and um, Brianna and I, Brianna and I and every, anyone else who would like to help, we're gonna sift through it to see what information, what we do have and what we don't, and then put it on our Google Drive so we have that history. So that's what that was referring to, Dennis. Oh, okay. That sounds cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she was amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. any, any corrections to yeah. the minutes? Um, if none, I would entertain a, mo uh, a motion to approve the minutes. Apparently, in depth today was my mouth, so. And a second. So did that, did someone make a motion? I didn't. I approve. I have to make a motion. <laughs> Protocol, Robert's rule, we make a motion and then we do a second and then we have discussion and then we vote. <laughs> so okay. ten, entertain a motion. So a motion to approve. Okay. Dennis, do you want to second it? I'll second it. Oh, thanks, James. Cool. We have a motion on the floor to approve the minutes from last month. Um, any more discussion? Being none, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Or aye or however, and opposed. Cool. Our minutes are passed. To that extent, um, we have Madsen back to do a presentation. Madsen Mathias, you all probably remember from last meeting, along with Ben Weiss, who's the director. Ben, I never know if this is your title, but I always call you the director of the Bicycle Pedestrian Program. <laughs> yeah, that's one of them. Um, I, <laughs> I recently, um, or within the last year, uh, my title has shifted a little bit. I'm the senior transportation planner for the city of Missoula. Oh, perfect. Well, we will add that to your accolades for the minutes. But um, we, you know, we um, had the discussion about um, the project last month and Mattson, I appreciate your willingness to come back and put some things together to give the committee members some more information. Um, do you have a presentation? I, um, yes, I do. Ran earlier and she said she hadn't received it, but if you want us to hand over <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you, you'd you like Brianne to share, hand it over to you? Yeah, I can just share my screen if that works. Oh, perfect. Okay, okay. Brianne, thanks. 
Perfect. Grant, can you help with that? I have permissions to do it. Perfect. So all I need, you're seeing now, you're seeing the screen? Mm -hmm. Perfect. So um, I wanted to start and say thank you to everybody, um, specifically Jim and Ben and Kathy. You all have provided a lot of really great insight um, as in direction and like forming the presentation and um, kind of guiding me on uh, on what I'm going to speak about today. And so I appreciate not only your interest, but your, your guidance. So um, what I wanted to show, <clears throat> so first are examples of tactical urbanism already around Missoula um, and this tactical urbanism through painted artwork. Um, tactical urbanism I did want to define is an approach to neighborhood building using short-term, low-cost, and scalable interventions and policies. So the image in the bottom left, I think we're all very pretty familiar with it. It's the city's quick build neighborhood traffic circles um, and kind of a lower amount of artwork. And then in 2020, you see the top left. Um, I did that one to focus uh, as like a demonstration project to kind of intend to show the potential um, for engagement and creativity that, that the neighborhoods can have. And so this was then repeated in 2021 um, alongside what we see in the middle, the AARP um, community build, that's gonna be wrong, community grant, um, and you know, some other artwork that we've done in that period of time. Um, so then here I, you know, there's a lot of potential for these projects to be successful in Missoula. And here is kind of where I wanna build on that. So with the top row, we see an existing appetite for public art in Missoula. These are examples of successful art projects that are already in Missoula. Um, that, you know, this, this fits very nicely into that stream. The bottom uh, row illustrate examples from other places of successful, of eye-catching, traffic-calming, community-building-focused art in um, the public right-of-way spaces. Using the wrong arrows. Uh -huh. <laughs> map is, um, this map is intended to show the, the spatial scale um, for potential for these types of projects. So we see the existing bulb outs on shilling, existing traffic circles that span the whole city. Um, quick note is that on Franklin Street, the circles are slightly more opaque. That's because I've learned that um, from Ben that those will be installed as permanent traffic circles with curbing and landscaping. So they will fade out of the, the realm of where we'd wanna do this kind of uh, artistic intervention. Then the triangles are the public right-of-way parks. This uh, Jim brought to me um, showing kind of especially locations where are very interesting slant, um, slanted kind of roads um, hit the gridded network and they leave a lot of space for things that are still, for spaces that are still part of the public. They're still in the public right-of-way and ripe for intervention um, and, and, should be, and should be considered. However, I have also learned that you know, public works had a very considerable amount of input and time and deliberation for the traffic circle interventions. So exactly what kind of potential is not the same across um, both types of public right of way. Um, and so then the stars, the existing street murals and our neighborhood greenway network, which um, you can see pretty much well connects a lot of this artwork um, to one another. So here, um, I wanted to kind of give an overview of the prior processes, who the source of funding was. Um, you know, some we had the ARP grant, a grant from the Office of Neighborhoods, and then one that I did essentially alone and with donations from a nonprofit. How much each one cost varied significantly, <clears throat> as did how long each one took to implement and the processes for implementation based on how many people were involved in the project, really. Um, obviously, they had different pay types and different processes. The one in the middle was not even prime. The one on the left used, it, used um, thermoplastic, which I don't know why that didn't get changed here, but or uh, heat molded plastic sheets, essentially. And then, you know, the AARP grants led by the city of Missoula, mine, the one that I initiated was a lot more focused on guerrilla urbanism, just getting out there and painting. And another one was kind of that halfway in between process. Um, and they also have very different scales of maintenance 
um, based on the processes that went into it and uh, the type of paint that was used realistically. So that's what we've done so far. Um, then I was uh, given a great resource by Ben um, based on New York City's program for street art um, to start building an estimate um, to have more of a consistent idea of how much these processes will cost these, these murals. Um, and also when we're using the right materials, right? So it doesn't always need to be that thermoplastic, but especially for maintenance concerns. Um, and if you wanna put the city behind it, it is beneficial to start to set the bar higher than just interior house paint that, that lasts. Mm -hmm. So um, the specs on how we did the calculations are at the top, one gallon of paint covers about 150 square feet calculate how much each type of paint costs, um, bring in a $20 per hour labor wage and an artist fee of 20% of the total program. Um, having you know, talked with Ben and other uh, departments in the city, they you know, can provide and have provided and will probably continue to provide the visibility and safety vests and any additional materials that are needed for that, as well as um, public works offering to pressure wash the areas before implementation. So running kind of an, an example of the average size of a traffic circle, about a thousand square feet, the total cost of that traffic circle with everything included would be about $2,600. So then kind of comparing the process that New York was using, um, the processes that we've done already and how we've, you know, given approval to people or been able to um, kind of jump, as I said, that guerrilla urbanism. And then Portland also had a, has a model for permitting um, street art projects. And so I borrowed from a lot of those, but some of the fundamentals and um, having spoken to Ben and seeing kind of what he would prefer given the scope of what the city can um, process and review at any given point, it would be, we, we recommend essentially that there's an application so anybody can apply. That's part of the community engagement, getting um, you know capital A or lowercase a artists involved um, and just having an ongoing arts call. People can submit their portfolio and a verbal description or a visual rendering of the proposed mural. A lot of the guesswork of other programs is taken out because we know exactly what the dimensions are going to be, where it's going to be located, how it's treated, it's a pretty consistent canvas for people to be applying for. And then once an application is approved, they would be put on a wait list um, when a project is ready. Essentially, you would contact the first person on the wait list, propose something along the lines of like, we would like to see this done in two months, here's the funding for it. And then the onus is back on the applicant to accept or decline. If they decline, you move to the next on the wait list. And if they accept, they can receive a permit from the city and that um, would promote um, the city then to give written notification to neighbors and or depending on how much um, development comes of this kind of a program, put it on, put it on the city's website and indicate that this is another pro program or project going on. So then <clears throat> recommended conditions taken again from those three projects and leaning pretty heavily on the conditions that we've been um, actually throwing around for, for the intersection murals that we've done so far. Um, I'll start first with the design criteria on the right side, because this is these are pretty much rules that we've been operating within. The art must fit within you know, the painted yellow circle, no words, copyrighted content, commercial messaging, logos, profanity, hate symbols. Um, and importantly, no mimicking of traffic control devices, no um, optical illusions so that people think that it's actually a 3D circle in the middle, you know, none of that. Um, and then on the other side, on this left side, some, some important process criteria <clears throat> because I know that Ben has been very physically and personally involved in a lot of these programs. And so a lot of the way that he's directed um, and kind of uh, provided oversight has, uh, has caused these process criteria to be met, has led to that, but essentially having that explicit list of 
um, not disrupting the traffic flow, like making sure people are staying inside of it, notifying the city um, that, and then once, you know, people were to receive funding to pay for any additional materials that are not covered by the stipend to know that, you know, your volunteers are under your purview of responsibility um, and then wearing those reflective safety vests. And then back to point one on the process criteria, um, they, they must use the, the approved paint in the approved stipend calculations, right? You know, we do the calculations based on saying, this is the right type of exterior paint, the right type of primer to use. This is what we've approved as part of the program. And so you must adhere to using these, these same materials. So then um, kind of, I guess, more food for thought for future installations, not necessarily um, there are all ideas or, or ways to move forward, but um, they could be suggestions for individual artists. They could be different ways to implement this program. I think that it would be, it's very flexible. So crowdsourcing materials, money, and time, you could provide a $2,600 stipend to an artist and they may not, um, they may get more volunteers that don't want to be paid um, for their time, or maybe they can do a paint drive and save money on that. Um, so there, you know, there are some options in there if they were to want to save more money for themselves. Coming up with hybrid options where you could use the house paint or that exterior paint and thermoplastic if desired. Um, there could be a scale for amateur versus professional artist stipends, new ways to source volunteers. Um, and then also further consideration kind of as you watch and observe how long these are able to stay and how well they hold up in different areas. Um, you know, balancing that paint quality and cost, and ideally having a place to store leftover resources. Um, that is something that at least on the two programs or projects that I've worked on, we've had a significant amount of leftover paint, just because you're not, you're not using the same ratios of every gallon of paint. Some of them you only needed for a very small accent piece, and it would be great to continue to revolve that to future projects. Um, so... Next, I wanted to give a little bit of tethering to um, what I'm talking about. First is that um, not only the Public Art Committee, but most of the long range plans in Missoula, most of the citizens in Missoula, all are part of a bigger, broader value of community engagement and wanting to see new ways to connect, new ways to um, kind of bring that into, into the atmosphere um, and foster those values. A big way to do that is through street front activation, creating places in our spaces, um, having people excited about getting outside and um, you know, creating these information getting and attention getting kind of spaces um, where people are encouraged to engage with their community. And another effect of these kinds of actions, putting more people in the street, engaging them with their spaces, is that people then reclaim the space. People are in the public right of way, they are frequented, they are expected by drivers to be there. And all of that actual physical infrastructure and art and plants encloses a street, but also setting the expectation that people will be on the streets contributes to traffic calming. Um, and then I wanted to tie it to the purpose statement that the Public Art Committee has, um, specifically um, the reflecting the city in the minds of its citizens and having art that will improve the quality of life in the area and be accessible. Um, and then, of course, the mayor of Missoula's strategic plan, which is enhancing opportunity and quality of life. I mean, creating a harmonious, natural and built environment, which I think a lot of this ends up striving to do as well in the artwork. And so that leads me to my request that the Public Art Committee establish a program for right-of-way art projects and seed that program with at least $2,650 to complete the first project. And thank you. I will stop sharing my screen and uh, be here for any questions. So I actually have a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, having coordinated the traffic signal box program since 2009 and working with the Department of Transportation, et cetera, in all of the neighborhoods, um, we went through and, and I, we went through a pretty darn stringent process even um, prior to beginning the project, working with other communities and see to see what works best there. Um, 
you know, part of, I, and again, um, Madsen, you know, I think this is a cool project, um, but, you know, part of me, the, the, the paint that you're using that, you know, versus the thermoplast, do you have a breakdown of the cost of that thermoplast project versus the paint project? What we got was what you provided us with was the, the breakdown of the paint, but not the breakdown of the thermoplast. So, I mean, my, my idea is always, okay, so what was that? Where, who was, you know, who was involved? What was the actual hardcore, um, the cost of that product? versus the paint and also, and this is not because we can't make a decision on this this week anyway. So, and again, last, or this month rather in, in our last thing, we um, James is gonna help us coordinate this as a um, subcommittee chair of this effort because um, from the last meeting, people were supportive. But my whole getting back to that is what, what are the cost comparisons? Because um, what we have learned with the signal box pro project is that people love artwork and you know there if it goes away they want to see it come back so the greater the longevity the better so that's why I was wondering in that ten thousand six hundred dollars um if we you could and we could put to get get together a subcommittee meeting in the near future or whatever and, and have a breakdown of that really what those material costs are because there may be some ways um with the committee's connections that we could work towards uh, that particular material versus the paint. The other thing you mentioned that DOT has um, specified paint, which seems to be different than the house paint. So if there, we could get a better grasp on, on that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, think I wanted to, oh, go I, ahead. Just wanna, I just wanna like, uh, had a little bit of context here. Um, I would hope uh, I did reach out to Ben and the $10,600 is part of the larger 12,000 or $10,600 is part of the larger $12,500 grant. Mm -hmm. My understanding that that was the, the cost for the paint, but also I wanted to give the information on the uh, DOT paint. Here it is. So mm -hmm. On the left, so they recommend. Oh, I live next to a fire station. So sorry. Um, they recommend exterior primer, and so five gallons of that is one hundred and seventy dollars, and then recommended a gallon of floor slash patio paint. Um, there are also. Oh, this is this is the actual DOT recommended paint versus. I mean that that is what their standard is. I'm not going to say yes for sure. Um, I can follow. Okay. I can mm -hmm. well, again, that's um, just something also recommended, like thickening agents and non-slip kind of additives that you can add. Mm -hmm. So, well, Kathy, again, could, it's just if we could get, and again, I just some, like some more specifics on that. I think this is really a great um, initial kind of discussion and, and, and initial information on all of this. Kathy, maybe I can answer some questions about the thermoplastic and, you know, because um, you're aware when I brought the third Myrtle project to this committee, that was um, the city was pretty um, adamant that that was what we wanted to see because of the durability and the dirt, you know, right. and how long it would last. And um, since that project has happened, you know, just in the last seven or eight months, I think that uh, our thinking has changed a little bit and we want to be. Um, a little bit more flexible. We, I don't know mm -hmm. that we would be as adamant that we'd want to use such a durable material uh, moving forward. And um, one of the reasons is that um, the art is certainly valuable and we want it to stay, but we also, these um, traffic calming treatments that we are using that we're deploying uh, pretty rapidly, we want to make them permanent um, before too long. And we don't have the, the funding to do it everywhere immediately, but we would like there to be a finite, or how do I want to say this? We are expecting there to be a finite timeline that these, um, that these intersection murals would exist because we would want to come through and make them more permanent with curb and, and plantings and things like that. And so um, what, what, we see and what Matt, the research that Madsen and I have 
been doing is reaching out to other communities and finding out what are the materials that you're using that have a little bit more life than interior house paint, but that might not be as expensive as that $17 a square foot um, mm -hmm. thermoplast. And so um, that's where, um, again, those uh, like using um, garage floor paint and, and heavy duty primer, um, that's what we're seeing in, in other cities as, um, as that, that material that they expect to get um, several years with kind of extreme wear and tear. One of the things that we, that's interesting is that um, that, that um, tile uh, pattern that Madsen did at the intersection of Maurice and uh, gee, I'm drawing a blank. What, which Hastings. one? Hastings. Yeah. Um, that was done with interior house paint. Uh, that one is over a year old. It survived a winter with, um, and it looks pretty much the, the way that it did after, you know, the day after um, she was done painting it. And so I think that there's, uh, if even just by bumping up the, the durability of paint type that we use, we're still going to get mm -hmm. several years of life at the, at the least um, out mm -hmm. of those. And I think that, um, again, we, we can run into, um, with the thermoplastic, one of the concerns is, gee, we better get this absolutely right, right away, because it's going to, that's a lot of money to, to spend. If we need to alter something or, or tear it up, that's a waste of an investment. And um, the, the, the hope, the thought with this request, or at least with this discussion item is that uh, we can start getting art out quicker and, and have an expectation that it can last a fair amount of time, but have it under a, uh, you know, within a, a less costly, um, you know, method that we can hopefully, uh, it won't cause a lot of heartburn and heartache if it, if it does have to go away for, for some reason. Um, so, well, part of the issue too is the public art committee doesn't have $26 to hand over to you. But um, I mean, even with all of the signal boxes, the public art committee, none of that money ever came from a public art budget. It was all raised through grants, public sector, private or private sector collaborations. So, and that equals over $100,000. Um, but the flip side of that is this is such, I personally think this is such a great project. It would not be difficult, in my opinion, to raise that kind of money for something like this. Um, and, you know, and I, and I, I truly, I, you know, one of the things I think that some of our smaller projects, and I call this smaller just because in the amount of monies um, that are necessary for it, they've, they've had such amazing impact on the community. We pay the artists $1,500 for the signal box program. And they, out of that 1,500, they are required to essentially pay for their materials. It pays for their labor, their fixed costs, their controllable costs. And theoretically, by the end of that, they have some profit. <laughs> um, but each one, one of those has truly, I mean, the neighborhoods love it, people, people love them. And I think that this would be, would be the same and could have the same impact. So I, um, I really think that there are some opportunities out there. Um, and again, I, I don't want to make you rehash the whole third and Myrtle project. Um, but I was thinking that you had some donations for that. Am I, um, oh, Ben, we lost, oh, there you are. You're at the top of my screen now. You were in the center of my screen, Ben. Were there some private donations for that as well? No, it was only a, it was a, a one standalone a grant, grant from the uh, AARP. Hmm. Um, I just you know, after the fact, some of the adjacent businesses um, contributed their own um, flower pots and picnic tables to that project. But <laughs> um, there, no, in terms of the artwork itself, the we used the grant to pay for the that thermoplastic material. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess, uh, regardless of the the amount of money, I, I think what the ask more is is to um, 
to establish a formal program similar to mm -hmm. the signal box program for these types of intersection murals through the public art committee so that we don't have to reinvent um the wheel every time we mm -hmm. we want to do a circle that we just we can kind of funnel through a process and raise money accordingly um as you mentioned mm -hmm. um for a, a specific um, program rather than on a project by project basis. Well, again, I I love the program. I love I love the idea of it. I love um, integrating artists into non traditional areas. Um, but what does everyone else think? Uh, I, this is Tony. I have a question. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so can you speak more, and I'm sorry, I can't, I'm driving right now, so I'm hands off, I can't see people's names, but can you speak more to, you mentioned that maybe the, um, like the longevity of the artist's work, is there a way to guarantee that, you know, the, their efforts would be up for X amount of time, or, I mean, do you kind of, is there already a premeditated plan on, you know, when more permanent fixtures would go up, can you speak to that? Yeah, that would be um, where my office and, and public works would play a role in, um, in the kind of allocation or the, the, the stating that, hey, this is where a project is going to come. For example, um, Madison had on her map, some of the circles were a different shade, uh, some of the intersections, because I was able to say these ones are going to be made permanent within the next two to three years where we're actively working on the project to make those permanent. <laughs> the other ones um, that are on the that are on the map that we've installed in this uh, kind of, you know, we've created the canvas um, ready for art. There is no current plan to make those permanent. And so um, as as much as we might want to see that happen soon, it's it's the reality is that those aren't going to happen anytime soon. The one the circles on Maurice Avenue, the circles, the new ones in the Lewis and Clark neighborhood. Um, there's actually a third one over there, Madison. I know I told you to hold off on that, but um, we got approval. Um, and then the ones <laughs> in the Franklin of the Fort neighborhood, um, those are all going to be there for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Um, um, you know, I mean, my. Oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Stony. You go ahead. I thought you were done. Uh, I, I was just going to offer my reflections. I mean, uh, uh, this seems like a lovely uh, opportunity, especially I feel like a lot of um, artists that are looking to get experience in doing public works. This is a really great opportunity for them, um, as well as more established artists. So I uh, appreciate your efforts putting this presentation together. Um, and that uh, seems exciting to me. You know, Sony, I was just going to address too, and with the signal box program, I mean, we've got that put together. And 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 again, I think um, if it's Matt's and if the if the committee agrees and the subcommittee, which we wanted to explore this further, could get together. Um, one of the um, aspects of that program is there is no guarantee as to how long those signal boxes and the artwork on those signal boxes. Um, will be there. There never has been. Um, that was one of the requirements from the highway department because they never knew if they had to change them out or not. So that's why we kind of call it the ephemeral project because they're there. And, you know, yes, we've had some that have been there since 2009. Others have been moved. And again, this where it goes back to the love of design, those designs. And Stoney is one of these people that benefited from it because she did this amazing piece on 39th and Russell and the neighborhood so loved it. So we raised an additional $1,500 or what, what that was, I guess it was maybe early on, Stoney, you can help me there. But we raised, you know, I raised another bucket of money so that Stoney could redo that artwork. Um, so, you know, it, it's just, I think people understand um, that there it's not their short term their, um there's artwork that will be there for a shorter term versus a longer term. So I don't um, I think I think this that shouldn't dissuade us. Um, and I, I'm actually I think it's exciting that you know even though I, we love I love the whole idea of thermoplast, um, 
that there is, are some paints that would have the longevity um, that would be needed. The, the other benefit I see there um, from a, a logistical standpoint is that um, uh, that by using paint instead of a material that we need to install as as city officials, um, it maintains some of the tactile um, and, and artistic function of the artists themselves. It creates an opportunity for a work day or work days with um, citizen volunteers or or other assistants. Um, there's a, a community building aspect to going out and actually implementing the design um, you know, having the artist implement the design that that isn't present with the um, kind of puzzle piece <coughs> and city installed thermoplastic material. Although I hope that everyone has had a chance to go to Third and Myrtle by Bernice's and check out that project because it really came out beautifully. That's cool. Yeah, I will say that every one of the artists that submitted was an art an artist who had submitted and was awarded a signal box. So you you had some dynamite people that put together some amazing, amazing designs. Um, James, what do you think? Do you, um... uh, a great presentation, Madsen, mm -hmm. and um, thanks for putting all that together. And the um, map function is really great. And I think it could be a critical uh, piece for going out and trying to fundraise for mm -hmm. these activities from adjacent businesses, property owners, school districts. So uh, after all of us hearing this, is this something um, that as the committee, we'd like to continue this collaboration um, and, and help, I, so I'm just trying to think of a timeline here, Madsen, and I, I, I don't mean to throw anything out that um, against what you were already thinking, but probably the first one would be next spring. So yes. that would, and again, not to make this all about process, but it does help to have the process down. Um, that would give you and Ben and whoever um, in the transportation division to work with the subcommittee from the public art committee, and kind of put the parameters together, really get a thorough understanding of um, those paints and all of those, because truly if, if you're going to do any kind of art call. I mean, we have to be very specific to the artists, as you all know, um, but that would give time to um, not only put together those parameters and kind of that rework that art call if it's necessary or not, but also um, do some fundraising for it and maybe do more than more than one. Maybe, you know, we try to do um, th three to five or more signal boxes, depending on how much money that can be raised. Um, but maybe it would be great to do more than one if that's what you're thinking. I, I guess I'm curious about that aspect of the process. Do you, do you put a call out and say, hey, we have three to five signal boxes that are bare and, and need art. Please donate mm -hmm. for those. And then you do the public art call or. Oh, no, no, we get, I, right, get the funding first. Everything that's what I'm saying. I'm, you you do a call yes. for funding. Um, no, I just go out and beg, borrow, and I write grants, and I approach foundations, and I ask businesses I have. Um, so, um, okay, I, we know specifically so, it's for the signal box in their area, typically. Okay. Um, and so, if I'm working with the neighborhoods on it, um, we work closely with with them, and um, they assist very often with some of the fundraising efforts with their neighborhood. For example, um, Grant Crick just donated, that wasn't a huge amount, but it was $300, over $300. Um, actually, I take that back. It was $1,800. So it was a decent amount of money. So, you know, there's, there's opportunity there. Once we have the money in hand, um, and that was the, um, last year I had sent you the um, art call. Once we have that money in hand, then we advertise. Okay. So we, um, that makes sense. I, I guess I see a potential challenge being that most, these projects are all within neighborhoods on, on low volume streets, whereas the signal mm -hmm. boxes are all like very high visibility and, and typically near commercial um, locations. So you might 
might be a, a challenge there. But one thing that we, I guess, um, from when I say we, I mean the public works division, we really like the art. We like the intersection murals. We, we want to see them continue. We want there to be an established process that is more, uh, that's more predictable and, and easier to follow that empowers neighbors and residents to pursue it on their own. Um, and we can help provide the, the guidelines and stipulations and, and sidebars from a materials perspective, from a, a public safety perspective and from a site preparation um, standpoint. But we don't wanna be writing the public art calls ourselves. We, we, we wanna help set up a program so that, um, so that hopefully that can happen within the existing um, kind of framework or process. And, and the way, um, again, the way that in New York, I, I shared a YouTube video in the chat um, of a friend of mine in New York who recently was commissioned to do a mural there um, in, within the right of way. And um, he said that he had basically submitted a general, con like a, an example of, there had been a call for muralists and he submitted a portfolio with examples of his work. And then um, he was selected as a as one person of many that that might be called on. And then when a project came up, he was assigned. He was given um, a specific intersection and said, "Can you do a design for this?" He did that. He did a design. He was awarded the contract, and then he was paid. You know. Um, kind of a similar breakdown to as Madsen included in her presentation, there was a materials um, and then a, a artist fee um, and a labor as well um, was was how he got paid. And so um, I guess in, in my mind, it makes a lot of sense to go about it that way, but uh, which is different than how we did the third Myrtle project where, or similar, but, um, but not the same because with that, what it was project specific, we did a, a call for portfolios, we paid artists who submitted or the finalists from that. And then we had someone do a design and paid that mm -hmm. person um, more, but there was no actual, um, the artist didn't do the actual installation, you know, city, city staff did. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's a way to accomplish it both. Um, but again, you still need to get those parameters and in, in the committee. I mean, we've done a number of projects since 1984. And I think could really help with those parameters and you could all, and you could end up with a project that how, how you want, how you want it to operate, I guess. So, um, and I just noticed it's 447 and we have a long meeting, but um, Madsen, Ben, um, James, and anyone else interested, could we get together in the next, couple of weeks before the next meeting, kind of iron out some of these questions. Um, and if the committee deems appropriate, move forward and, and, and try one project at least and see if we can get it or get the parameters set up so we could do it. How does everybody feel about that? I just, I, I just wanted to chime in really quickly and say that I, as a transportation planner and also serving on the public work committee, for the city council, I am hugely supportive of this effort. And I recently completed a year long um, program with Smart Growth America, where I showed these pictures and, and um, talked a little bit about the, the efforts here in Missoula. And they were so impressed mm -hmm. on many levels, but primarily the fact that this is such a good community engagement tool that we have. Um, that mm -hmm. Which is so much more than just bringing neighbors together, but um, I really like that aspect of it. And so I guess my question is, by bringing an artist, are we limiting the input of neighbors or has it worked really well how, how has that worked so far? And I guess my only concern is that by having an artist and commissioning this art, are we hindering public neighborhood input on a project? Because um, I, would, I would hate to lose that aspect of what makes these such a um, community-oriented 
projects where people take ownership by participating. They take ownership to the point of maintenance sometimes. Um, and so I'm, I'm just curious to know how, how that would work or how you envision that continuing to work because it's what makes them so special. Uh, to me at least, and I, I have a huge appreciation for art. So what, what I see on the ground is beautiful. But what makes it even more beautiful is the fact that people from the neighborhood, kids and everyone have taken part in the process of creating it. So I would, I would really like to see that continue. I think that could actually happen. I mean, even with the signal box project, we always involve the neighborhoods and the businesses and they're involved in the selection of the art. And I, and again, I, Ben, I don't want to, um, I mean, I think, with your idea in the difference, I think there's still opportunity. And I, and again, if we're talking about people actually coming out to help execute with the artist, um, I, I think that's a real plus there. And I've, there's probably more, to, there's probably more ways that we can do that. Um, but one of the things we do, you know, we need to make sure of, or we, the collective we, is that we do continue to ma maintain this involvement of the neighborhoods. Madison, you go first. I raised my hand general. to defer to you. Okay, um, yeah, sure. So I appreciate so much everything that you just said, Mirtha. Um, thank you. I agree that, and I think that Kathy, that's a great point that the neighborhoods, one, I agree the neighborhoods should be involved. The great point is that if the neighborhoods are volunteering, they will still be involved. Um, I don't know. I don't actually know that that's the biggest necessity. I mean, one that I did on Hastings and Maurice, I happened to grow up on Hastings Avenue, but I did it alone for the most part. And other people that came to help me weren't necessarily from that neighborhood. And just the act of being out there and painting you know, you'd have the neighborhood, or the neighbors that would go on their evening walks or people that would drive by. And so you're catching a lot of that and you are still engaging, um, which is why I liked what Ben was saying about the like tactile, tactile experience instead of like the city coming in with thermoplastic, just having people out there that can answer questions that can say, I have a paintbrush, would you like to join? Um, and I, you get a lot of that. Um, I would say that, yes, Franklin to the Court, they were very involved in the process, or the neighbors in action, they were very involved in the process. They gave me very specific constraints on what kind of design they would like to see. And, you know, something for them is that they wanted something that looked like it could be done if they didn't get a lot of neighborhood interaction. And then something that people could also contribute to. So that's why I picked that, you know, grassy design that you can just paint flowers wherever you want on it, was so that it could look done or you could add as many flowers as you wanted and it can always be evolving. Um, I do also want to bring in the stipulation that involving a lot of people makes it a very difficult process. Um, like having all of the neighbors have all their own little artistic ideas or even involving them in more of the later design stages can it can hold up the project. You have people that, you know, they'll maybe you spill, right? The more people there, the more people stepping in wet paint, um, people will splatter around, you know, unless you have a very clear rendering and a skilled person to bring that idea onto the table. You know, there have been times where I've had to cover up what somebody else has done just to make the whole piece kind of work together. Any cooks in the kitchen never gets done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That kind of thought. And so, you know, I was really like, oh, I want this to be this collaborative art piece that the community comes in and works on together and it's all neighbors. And realistically, I think that's uh, not real. That's not realistic. You need to have a design and you need to have one person that comes in and says, this is design here, paint in this square. And just having somebody out there, I think the neighbors get involved. Um, I hope that answers your question. But um, yeah, and again, like, as long as, you know, we'll see a visual description of the art too. Um, and some people hate the art that I've done and they let me know, um, but they also- Welcome to our world. <laughs> well, right, but they also still like the project. And that's, I think my favorite feedback when somebody has criticism of it is that they're like, I like what this is getting at. I just don't like this art. And I mean, realistically they could go over and paint over it and there's no rule. 
I had no rules so they could paint over it. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. It's definitely going to be valuable to engage the neighbors, but um, there's there's a balance there. And I think commissioning an artist, especially if they're a local artist, Missoula is small enough that I think there's still that sense of camaraderie. I see the answering that question, Mirta, in a very good one. I see that as part of the role of this um, small subcommittee get together in the next couple of weeks that Madsen, Jimmy, and any other interested parties and myself will, uh, I guess what I see coming out of that group would be a flow chart that showed exactly where the opportunities for neighborhood engagement are, whether it's at the selecting a design stage or it's actually operating a paintbrush, uh, you know, or getting a roller out. Um, and I think that we're, you know, when we get together and talk, that will be some of the most fun you know, I'm hoping that we get can actually do it in a room with a whiteboard and we start drawing out a flow chart for what this process would look like so that at either the next meeting or the one after that, what we're bringing back to the public art committee is this is exactly what we want the program to look like and how it would function. Because I think that would ultimately make it easier for Kathy and, and other members to go out and, and start fundraising for it because we'd be able to say, these are the locations, exactly. this is the... These are the materials. This is exactly how the program will function. Yeah, specifics. Yeah. I, I feel like we've done two thirds of the work and we're, we, there's still a little bit more to do before we um, are all on the same page about that. Well, great. So to wrap up, um, we did approve um, pursuing this project at our last meeting. So James, can you call a meeting? I mean, I would love to be a, a part of that subcommittee meeting just because I think I might be able to lend some advice based on the single boxes and every other program that we've done. Um, but anyone else in Muerta, is that something you, with your background that you could be on the subcommittee for a bit to get it going? <laughs> well, um, anyone else interested? I'm interested. Oh, that's great. So James, why don't you, um, if you can work with Madsen and Ben on a time frame, maybe you, you seriously, you could just email um, or work with Brianne on this and um, email the entire committee, CC me, and then um, we, well, you can move forward. Well, yes, thanks, Kathy. Perfect. Ben, thank you. Madsen, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Perfect. Um, <laughs> now on to budget. Um, Miss Brianne. You know, you, you all know I'm like trying to look at this in a business way as well. And we are still working with finance to separate. Right now, there's not a whole lot of money in project money. We have admin, some admin money and some maintenance money, but we're still working with um, city finance on that. But um, one of the things that became very apparent and you know, the meeting ran long and this might not be the appropriate place to discuss this uh, or not the appropriate place, but I don't know that there's gonna be time to discuss this like I had wanted to, but um, with new members, so many new, with our latest new members, I just thought it was important that everybody had a thorough understanding of really kind of where our money came from and how the, it ended up being expensed and then ending up with a net operating income or which is essentially the remainder of our budget. So um, Brianne will email all of this to you. Um, and essentially it's just an, it is an overview, like I said, of income and expenses that we would have. And this is what we are working with finance to actually put together. So we'll have some sort of report project by project on a monthly basis, um, or at least depending on their schedule, a quarterly basis of where, I'm, what monies are coming in and what monies are going out and how they're being expensed as they go out. So. Um, and just real quickly over this, I mean, we're, we're really looking at um, four areas of where we get our income. We have the percent for art program and it, 
as again, I'm, if, I know I'm repetitive for some of you, but we essentially, every time there is a city project, except streets, sewers, and wastewater treatment plant, one and a half percent of those construction costs should be allocated to the public art committee. Of that one and a half percent, one percent essentially goes to art and administration and the half of percent goes to maintenance. Up until we had this ordinance change, we did not have a maintenance budget. And everything we did was on a fundraising case by case basis. Um, so what, when Gran emails this to you, I just made up some placeholder names of projects, placeholder amounts of money and <laughs> kind of did that division. So of that 1% that goes actually to arts and administration, the committee can, should allocate it by ordinance, we allocate no less than 80% to the art, up to 20% for administration. Now, when the ordinance was for first pass, we didn't have technology. We didn't have a lot of the things that make our life easier today in part of that dissemination of art calls and everything else. I mean, we used to snail mail everything. We had to print everything on paper. We put paper. Well, obviously we don't have to do that. Um, so under the expense categories, what just as an example, I took those incomes and kind of divided it one where we got a lot of money and 80% went to art and 20% went to administration and projects that we decided we, we needed to fund to support that art. Some where 80% went, actually more than 80% went to the art because as a committee, we can say, look, if we're getting $50,000, it's not going to cost us that you know as much in our marketing and and we don't have other costs so we can actually allocate more money to the art um, we also can allocate 80 percent to the art retain some of our administrative costs because we know we would have other projects in the future where we might need some of that administrative money um, but also maybe use some donation monies which is another source of our funding so i you know, those three, and I'm not going to belabor by going through each one of those. Um, hopefully the math is right and I did excel correctly here. But what is, as far as the income, the expense ratios on the bottom are there just to kind of elaborate and they all relate back to the specific projects. Um, so we get the one and a half percent when and if there is any kind of public construction, except for streets, sewers, and wastewater treatment plants. <laughs> We get donations and everything from private sector to public, you know, to individuals, businesses, et cetera. Um, grants and foundations um, put that in as a separate category. And then the other part is um, the city of Missoula in working with the individual departments. Um, we might be working with the re redevelopment agency. We um, you know, we did just work with the Missoula Urban Transportation District. They didn't transfer monies over, but they very well could have. So that could have gone in to another one of our income streams. Um, again, then we have our expenses. Um, and as, as I said, if everyone could kind of look through this, because I really think it's important that we all know where our money comes from and how we as a um, committee can expense it. And it is our responsibility to do that, obviously, with care. Um, then on the very bottom, um, I just, you know, I put something in there for maintenance, just so we could see how some of that maintenance money could be spend, spent. Um, and then at the very, very end, taking away all of those expenses from the income so we know what our net operating income is for art, administration, and maintenance. So I did. I didn't mean to belabor this point, but um, there are some some of our new committee members had no idea, truly, where our money came from. And um, there are people in the outside world that think we're just handed a pot of money because we're the City of Missoula Public Art Committee. 
And we all know that's not true. So I, I just think this for some, um, I, I'm hoping this will make it a little more clear. So um, what do you all Kathy, think? I have a couple. Uh-huh. Oh, I have a couple of questions if I, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Yeah, um, of course. Uh, what, what, one is, uh, do we have a way of accepting uh, online donations? Can people jump onto a portal and easily make contributions? Or what is the uh, path for us to physically receive funds from businesses and individuals? Right now, we do not have an um, on our website. We haven't. It's been one of the goals. Um, frankly, I didn't work on website development with that subcommittee. So, um, but we have always wanted an opportunity to be able to take donations online. Brands working with the new website, and I think that's something that makes sense for people. Um, you know, it's very similar to we wanted. We wanted to do some crowdsource fundraising at the end of every year. And um, our intentions have been good. We have not done it. Um, otherwise, is, we flip, oh, I'm sorry. Otherwise, we get monies. Um, if people want to make donations, they essentially write a check or, um, you know, whatever, however the city can take money is how we can accept that money. So, I mean, I say check because I'm a check writer, write a check to the Public Art Committee, and it goes into our funds at the city. Uh, thanks, Kathy. And then the, the other question I had that really is kind of connected to that, but do, do we have a, a, any way that we track who has made contributions to PAC over the years? Um, do we do we do any donor engagement um, yep. activities other than one-on-one -on -one solic solicitation for specific projects? We have a record of everybody who has donated um, monies, except for when the first com the committee first started. Um, the city sold bicentennial coins, and they so you could buy those for a dollar or two dollars or something like that. They sold about four hundred dollars worth. Those are the people we have no record um, of. But as far as Ongoing in this, again, I think, you know, that's a great question, Sony. I think it's one of those things we can do better. We do thanks. Um, we've gone back. We, meaning the proverbial I, have gone back to the same donors and they've been willing to redonate. We've never, we've not done any kind of mass recognition or thank you, which is not a bad idea. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kathy. And I, I just want to throw out there too, Brianne, I'm happy to chat. There's some various um, kind of online platforms that uh, could be useful to us as a website integration as a way to accept donations. So I have a couple of resources that I'm happy to, to send Jill's way um, to see if they may benefit PAC. That's great, Stoney. Thanks. Um, thank you, Stoney. So Sorry, Kathy, one sec. Um, this is Brianne. I do know that Arts Missoula does accept donations on behalf of the Public Art Committee, but I don't really know the flow there. But I know right. that on their website, there is an option for that. And I think that that is embedded in the Public Art website, but I'm not sure. I, I was going to ask you the same thing. And considering that this is not a nonprofit, I... I'm curious to know how people can donate money to their committee other than through Arts Missoula, because I guess I'm curious to know how, if someone gives money to the committee, it would have to go through the city of finance and administration. Uh -huh. And so there's all that process there. It's yeah. really not that much of a process we've been doing. I mean, for us, I mean, it, we've been getting donations since 1984, and essentially the money has gone into city finance once. Um, and again, Arts Missoula, we wrote the original grants for that. Um, one of, in order to deal with the 501c3 aspect of it, we have funneled monies through Arts Missoula, which then has funneled it through us to finance. So, I mean, it's, I will say it hasn't, 
it really hasn't been difficult in getting that money into the finance. We, you know, we just did the monies from the Grand Creek neighborhood and it flowed seamlessly. That, that's good to hear. Yeah. I was curious to know how. I think sometimes I, that works. Some, some of the folks in finance, as they change, it's we are an anomaly because we're being an official city entity and really not having monies directly budgeted towards to us, but then having monies come in. So um, we we tend to go through an educational process every time something changes there. <laughs> So um, did I, was that clear for most of you with Brianne hands that out? I mean, I, what I thought would be good is if she emails it to you and everyone takes a look at it and says, this does make sense, this doesn't make sense. Um, let's be a little more explanatory here. It's part of, you know, we can then put that in our process and procedures book. And so it will live beyond us and we can, use it for educating new members and um, just keeping ourselves aware of what's what. So if you could all take a look at that and say, this is too confusing or it's not confusing, um, that'd be great. So does that work? Alrighty, Sony, you're here. Um, we have been talking next agenda item rebranding. We've been talking about new logos and et cetera, et cetera, for over a year now. And Stoney brought it back up again. So I think it's, we have um, talent, we have some time and um, should take that up again. So Stone, do you wanna um, give us your ideas there? Um, well, I'm nearing Evero Hill, um, oh. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I I think that what I recall coming to mind last time, uh, you know, as this spark flew across my mind, was just yeah, thinking about our various efforts and kind of limbs of what the pack is is up to what we want to be up to um, and using branding efforts to help kind of amplify our impact in initiatives. I mean, I think it makes sense to work, work with somebody like set up a, a budget um, for it and, um, you know, maybe take some bids or whatever, but it, it seems like it would be nice to kind of have a visual overhaul um, and maybe it's even kind of combined with some awareness raising or, you know, I don't know. I know those mm -hmm. lovely banners that goes with downtown, you know, uh, just, um, yeah, kind of breathing some life into the kind of face, the appearance of PAC from the outside. So um, do you want to maybe again, um, people who are interested could get together before our next meeting and maybe come up with some solid ideas. Um, I think um, Ginny Merriam would need to be involved and want to be involved on this as the city's marketing person. Um, so can you look at your schedule, Stoney, and, and maybe send out a invite to the committee and whoever wants to come can be there? Um, sure. I, I guess I'm curious if anybody has any um, like recommendations on people that they've worked with. I don't know kind of the red tape around who we can or can't work with, but um, does anybody have any recommendations of people worth reaching out to in the community? Um, I've worked with a lot of marketing people, so I could email you some and um, and I'm sure other people have too, based on um, what they've been doing in life outside of public art. Um, but I think to come back, uh, you know, if we could get some folks together and just come back with some, maybe some more definitive, yes, we need a new logo. Yes, we want to be, you know, a marketing campaign that would include this, 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 and this. 
um, and maybe look at how it integrates with some of the other things we're doing. Um, does, that, does that make sense? And we, you know, yeah, if there's people outside the committee we want to invite, um, the committee members could maybe make suggestions to you and um, you can invite them and whoever could make it could come and um, whoever can't, can't. Um, the reason I mentioned Ginny is, is, is she's integral to a cohesive city marketing effort with departments and entities. So um, I think she would like to be involved. Mort, am I speaking there? Yeah, maybe you can connect us. Yeah. I guess I'll, I'll show my ignorance here, but I didn't know that there was a logo other than the city's banner with uh, public art committee. Am I, did I miss? The oh, it's on top. You no, know, we've had one. Um, actually, it was done in the 80s. <laughs> and Robinson did our logo. Um, and it has, it's the triangle. It's been on, well, on our letterhead. If you saw the cop, Muerta, you actually, we haven't sent out anything with a letterhead on it. Um, but it was adopted in the 80s and truly has never changed. <laughs> so people have been looking at um, a little something more contemporary and um, maybe more associated with the city's logo. Who knows? But it's, it, it's a um, right triangle that is teal blue with the city of Missoula Public Art Committee to the right. Okay. So, um, Stoney, I'm gonna let you coordinate that if you would. Um, and Brianne can help on this. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Dash Sculpture. There has been a lot of activity and Dennis is going to lead off. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's uh, progressing along pretty nicely um, with Mike and with the, uh, we've kind of narrowed it down to the library as a possible location. <clears throat> and they have a uh, library board meeting next Wednesday at six o'clock. And so Kathy and I will be introduced to the board um, either, it'll either be virtually or in person. I'm not sure which one it would be, but uh, we'll be introduced to the art committee and then uh, we'll uh, introduce the uh, proposal for the sculpture from uh, Mike Ludstick, uh, the Dash uh, sculpture and which is uh, funded, uh, we don't have to do any funding with that. So um, that wouldn't be involved with that. And uh, I am in touch with the city. Uh, Mike has uh, <clears throat> con or, uh, inquired about the distance of the sculpture from the wall, if there'd be any restrictions that way. He found a restriction where it was four inches. And so I'm in touch with the city to see exactly what they come up with. Uh, and in their words, as to what the uh, distance would be from the wall that a sculpture can project. And uh, so we've uh, sent them uh, images since the city images of some of the walls that were being considered and then i'm just waiting to uh hear back from them to see uh what that distance would be um and then like i say we'll uh, make our presentation to the art board or the library board next wednesday so we'll have more of an answer after that for the next meeting Hey, Brianne, could you, I emailed you the photos. Um, I don't know if you can pull them up and we can show the um, locations that we 
talked with the library about and met with them about? Hi, Kathy. I'm so sorry. I am logged out of my email on this computer, oh. so it might take me a minute. Um, if oh. you have them up on your screen, I did make you a co-host, so you should be able to share. I don't screen. have them up on my screen, but I can certainly get them. Um, I think, and we mentioned, boy, do I have a lot of stuff open. <laughs> um, we mentioned that the one of the locations was as you enter in the library from the lower level, um, that seems to be the favorite location of both um, Hanover and Elizabeth Jonko, the director and assistant director of the library. Um, the other locations were up on the fourth floor. There were a couple of walls up there. Um, one of the reasons that Hanor and Elizabeth um, had suggested that we those may not be approved by the library board is that those are locations that have been reserved for changing exhibits. So um, to that end, um, we'll probably, you know, when we do the presentation, I am thinking that the, the board will choose, and I think Dennis probably, we all are thinking that the board will actually choose um, the locations, the location that is this roughly 10 by 10 foot black wall with the ceiling angled um, up probably at about a, in a 30 degree angle. So maybe something from the ceiling and the wall, just as you come into the library from that lower level. And I have too many things open on my computer and, and I'm having a heck of a time. I did log into my email, Kathy, oh. but I'm not seeing it. I don't think that I've received it. Did you just send it? Nope, I sent it about 3.45. One second. I might add the location is, uh, that we're considering is as you walk into the library, there's the stairway that goes up to the second floor, but then around underneath that stairway on the back side of it, is that wall that's 10 feet by 10 feet, and then it angles up at the slope of the stairs underneath that. And it's a dark surface. Um, I'm not sure if that needs to be changed or, or what for the art, but uh, that's where it's, uh, that's where that location is at. Uh, uh, uh. Um, Kathy or Dennis, uh, is the proposed sculpture uh, sort of flexible to the site since it seems to be in a public um, egress like kind of area? Is it placeable or can the can it be moved to different site or relocated or or share uh, space with uh, other purposes? Or is it is it primarily uh, sited and just uh, permanently installed? Yeah, it would definitely be a, a permanent installation, um, and it does require um, electricity to it because it's uh, it's uh, reflective uh, materials, uh, reflective steel and cut glass, and uh, he usually uses electricity to. Uh, enhance the uh, image of the sculpture. Did, um, let me see. Brianne, I just sent him again. I just forwarded one of the emails I sent to Dennis. Um, you know, and he has, Mike has been coming up with some ideas um, still that might work for that space. So he, um, we haven't seen any drawings. He's working with a designer to get us some more specifics. So we have them for the meeting. So we will send them on to the committee. But it is, I, it is our understanding that this will be something that is, specifically made for that location. Now, if he doesn't use the ceiling, it 
there may be an opportunity to um, move it to another location. But Rianne just put it up on the screen. This is a side view um, with one of the spontaneous construction art pieces there. But um, if you look to the left of the red, white, and blue desk, you'll see the wall that is vertical. And then obviously the ceiling that's going up at that angle. Um, Brianne, could you pull, pull up one of the others? So there, this is as you're coming up the stairs and that's the roughly 10 by 10 foot wall. That is just one solid black wall. And then of course the ceiling coming up towards the top of the image. And there we have it. So in that, um, and from our understanding is, is the preferred location for the library folks at this point. But this is, you know, what's exciting about this is obviously the collaboration between the library and the public art committee. Um, they're officially, and more to help me, but they're officially a county entity within the city. I mean, obviously city limits. So um, everybody at this point, um, we haven't talked to any of the board, but everybody is excited about the collaboration. And the other collaboration would be with the art committee, the library and the uh, DASH organization, which is uh, actually financing the project for uh, art in smaller communities around the, around the country. So um, perhaps we can get uh, some Missoula artists on a national level and get national exposure through the DAG committee once we uh, get involved with them in this particular sculpture. So um, I think there's some possibilities there for some national exposure to some of, the, some of our art. Cool. Um, questions, anyone? Um, of course, if we'll let the committee know when we are going to be at the library board meeting. So if anyone would like to join on that Zoom link um, or join us in person, I'm sure you're welcome. How come, more? how come they get to meet in person? Is it because they're a county entity officially or do you know? What is that? Do you know why the library, how can they get to meet in person? Is it because they're a county entity or? You mean the commissioners or the library? No, the library board. Do you, do you have any idea? Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I don't think it has to do with city versus county because the mm -hmm. health department regulations are both city and county. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. that they just have the, the space and they feel comfortable enough to meet in person. Mm -hmm. You know, if we could borrow their meeting space, we could do that too and make sure that we're, you know, meeting all the social distancing requirements. So we could meet in person. We have been not been told that yet. <laughs> so, oh. oh, I see what you mean. I know that in the city, some departments are meeting in person. Uh, uh -huh. Any public meetings are not taking place in person. So city council isn't meeting in person. Committees are not meeting in person, but that's why, um, mm -hmm. you know, board members, I'm sure can meet um, just like any departments within the city when they have their staff meetings, they can meet if they mm -hmm. can meet the social distancing requirements. Right, so our subcommittees can meet, but our actual monthly meeting, which is a public meeting, we cannot meet. Person. Yeah, and I think it's in part to protect the potential public. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And especially with the age of COVID. Um, yeah. Well, have we we'll, indicated where the meeting would be? Pardon? Yet? I'm have so, they indicated where the meeting would be? Um, Anor has not said that yet. So, you, is she not in the emails she sent us? So, we can ask her and make sure she lets us know. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, we've, you know, we've got more agenda items, um, signal boxes. I'm just gonna quickly say nothing new from last time. Um, 
Indigenous Mural Project, Danielle is not with us, so um, we don't have an update there. I'm calling it the Public Art History, our next agenda item with Joan Jonko. We, um, again, I think I mentioned that before, as soon as we receive those boxes, we'll go through them and um, retain information that we don't have, um, scan it, do whatever we need to do so that we'll um, have that. Um, Rattlesnake Neighborhood Sound Wall, um, there's been no action on that. Um, I think the committee is regrouping. Um, and um, just a quick follow up, not on our agenda, but it was last month. Um, Lillian Nelson and her husband are going to be cleaning the sound wall um, in the, at the Van Buren Roundabout this Friday. They're going to be there at 10 if anybody wants to show up and work with them um, or take photos or do whatever or just come by and say hello. Um, and she's very excited. Um, I am going, there had been some folks in the Rattlesnake that we're very interested in the cleaning. So um, I'm gonna let them know if they wanna come and help Lillian and her husband. Um, Brianne did turn in her invoice, so she will be paid the $300 for that. Um, I also have acquired all of the safety, traffic safety memorabilia, i.e. the candles and the um, sidewalk close signs. Um, from one of my clients, and they always loan us those things for the signal box program. So they are going to loan it to us um, so we can protect Lillian and her husband. So it's a good thing. Um, I also have a call in, just a, a little footnote on that project, um, have a call in to the highway department to see if they um, think it's necessary or not necessary, but to see if um, once it's cleaned, if they could put another clear coat on there for protection. So no, no response from them yet. But um, ideas, has anybody been traveling and have seen some great public art projects? <laughs> or is anybody thinking of things that we could do from the few of us that are still here? <laughs> mm -hmm. Do we have any announcements? Hmm, nothing. Kathy, do you know if the, um, are there any possibilities with the airport expansion to work with them as a, a place where some public art can go or? Yeah, I think there's always possibilities. Um, we had, a, a, when they were doing all of that, I talked to them about allocating a percent, but because of course it's not a city building, that didn't happen. Um, but yeah, I think there there could be some opportunities there. You know, they um, they wanted to work with we did work with them actually in trying to do some artwork on the temporary containers that the um, temporary walkway systems. But then they did not have the money. And one of the suggestions we had had was for them to use some of the Opportunity Industries artwork and use vinyl and put it on all the walls. Um, but they didn't have money for that. But it's not something that we could explore with them and try and do something for this. Um, speaking of that, um, Muerte, if you can help us keep our eyes on things. Um, I don't know if you all saw in the Missoulian Parks and Recreation is um, doing some community involvement um, programs for a potential, it's not a, a community center, I was gonna say civic center, but a community center, which of course, 1% for art would be allocated um, if that project ever got underway, or one and a half percent, I'm sorry. Um, again, for those of you who, I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but um, the when the current when Currents was built, as well as Splash, um, we did get eighty thousand dollars, and because of the shortage of monies, um, building costs for Parks and Recreation, 
we put that money towards functional art. So hence the bike racks at Splash Montana and um, the the um, relief that is on the walls of currents. So for those of you, it would have been plain old concrete, except we hired um, Jim Todd and then had that imagery sandblasted into the wall. So um, something to keep our eyes open on. So any other projects coming up, Muerta? Um, we we know there's past ask, projects. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about the uh, North, the Karis Park, but that's not an actual building, but it's all city, it's city. We, yeah, we get monies from the park. So okay. when the city is contributing towards that, we should be getting one and a half percent. Great. Um, no, not that I know of. The only other thing that I was thinking about just now is um, uh, the LA program um, played by Radius Gallery. Mm -hmm. they, when they partner with different either artists or organizations, have we put our name in as a potential organization and then put a call for art, you know, and, and I think that the way, so the way it works is then once the art is produced, they, they put it, they print it out, essentially put it on the mural uh -huh. taken down. If you get, it's yours to keep and you can sell it. So I'm wondering, or auction it off. I'm wondering if that could be a potential small a future. A future maybe source. show for artists and have us work with um, yeah. Billy and Nelson who did the, um, well, three of the signal boxes and the sound wall at Van Buren. She's the coordinator of LA. So one oh, of the, that's right. Yeah. So one of the things we've done for them, um, because it is such an amazing project, is um, have put together a, um, for the public art guide, um, have featured LA in that. So I think it's a conversation with Lillian to say is maybe is there's a way we can do um, a collaborative project based on, I'll try and find out her schedule or what their schedule is for future exhibits. Yeah. There's a way we can collaborate on one. That's a great idea. And then the other, you know, city, I guess, project is um, if the purchase of the federal building comes through, then that would be um, a potential opportunity. That is an interesting thought. I wondered about that. Um, mm -hmm. Because there might be construction costs associated with that. Right. Great. Right? We, um, yeah, we have, to, we have to keep these things in mind. You know, um, previous finance directors used to keep us pretty well informed on all of that too. And also made sure that um, in that budgeting process that the percent or percent and a half, depending on which budget director was always taken into consideration on projects. So we'll need your help on that. <laughs> um, anyone have I'll any- keep, I'll keep an eye out for anything. Thank you. <laughs> Um, anyone have anything else? We are running long. See, this is making up for the last two meetings where we got out early. <laughs> the, anyone have anything else? Um, thanks for putting up with me on that little budget discussion. Um, again, please take a look at those. And if it's not understandable, let me know. Um, and we'll, so we, we can make it understandable. I've tried to color code certain aspects of it income and expense to make it somewhat correlated. Um, but if you think of anything um, that we have missed or if we need to be discussing, um, please email me and um, CC Brianne on that. And also um, let's schedule those committee meetings so we can maybe get some of these other projects off the ground. <laughs> so thanks all. I think with that, we are adjourned. I appreciate everyone's time. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.
Thanks. See ya. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks, Dennis.